welcome to episode four of the Digital Transformation Series. Um, I hope that you've all had a chance to tune into the other three that we have run in this series. Um, if not, you can view those all on demand via innate.com. So today we're joined by Cameron Mills, who's the Director of Project Controls for North Eastlink, and Michael Maslin, uh, the Technical Manager for Major Projects from WSP. It's a real pleasure to talk to these two gentlemen today. Um, I've known them both for some time and had the pleasure of working with them over the last three years or so in different uh, guises. Um, so I know for a fact this is going to be a very, uh, very dynamic conversation. Really looking forward to it. So, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Um, so why don't we start by letting you introduce yourselves to the audience a little bit. I know you've both got some really great backgrounds that are going to help add colour to the conversation. So perhaps, Cameron, I'll let you do a bit of an intro first and tell, tell everyone a little bit about your background and what you're doing today. And then uh, same for you, Michael. So, Cam, you first. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rob. Uh, my current position is Director of Project Controls on the North East Link project. It's the largest civil infrastructure project ever undertaken in the state of Victoria's history. It's around about $16 billion. It's a part of the broader Major Transport Infrastructure Authority $80 billion big build program uh, in Melbourne in Victoria, Australia. Uh, I've been in this position for about two and a half years, which has required me to set up essentially a project controls functionality uh, on the project. I've been familiar with Innate products for probably four and a half years now. Uh, I brought them into a previous uh, employer, Lendlease, uh, and have done the same uh, on the current project I'm in at the moment. So we're using multiple modules in here at the moment. So very familiar with the products. Um, and yeah, that's what I'm up to at the moment. Fantastic. Yeah, it's exciting, Cam. I think there's a massive project ahead for, obviously for NELP, and it's gonna be very exciting to see how that, how that rolls out over the next few years, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Michael, tell us a bit about your background. Yeah, good morning. So, um, so I'm technical manager for major projects here at uh, WSP, um, and our major projects capability, which is what we really call project and program management, is really where we act as the the PMC or delivery partner or PMO as agent of the owner. Um, we deal with projects around the hundred million dollars to ten billion dollar uh, capex values and beyond, um, and in this. In this role, I'm responsible for advising our clients on digital project delivery technologies, which includes disciplines such as project controls, contract management, schedule management, construction management, and, uh, and execution. Um, and I lead the, the deployment of those technologies for, for, uh, for our clients. Um, 20 or so years of experience in advisory and implementation of uh, digital tools for capital project-centric uh, organizations. Great. Yeah, yeah, brilliant perspective that you bring to the conversation, Michael. I know coming from both sides of the of the, the fence in terms of vendor and client and the um, understanding you've got across those use cases, um, really exciting. So great to have you two with us um, because you're not just experts in your field, but the reason that we we're so keen to talk to the both of you is because you're also practitioners who've been able to make things happen in the space of digital transformation and I guess that's really what this is about, is talking about um, what it takes to make it a reality um, and take it beyond just the concept of digital transformation. So we'll get a chance to dig into that in a good bit of detail and hear from both of you. Um, we just released it in our Global Projects Outlook, and that was really a pulse check for the industry where we asked 300 of the world's largest capital project owners and contractors around the world what their perspective was over the last year um, and going back a little bit further in terms of their thoughts on digital transformation, amongst other things. Uh, it used to be that the construction engineering sector was on the list of uh, the, the slowest for adopting technology. Um, still the case, largely lagging behind a number of other industries, but we have seen a sharp uptick over the last couple of years, uh, particularly in APAC. So this seems a really appropriate topic for us to, to dive into and just get a bit of an understanding of the different reasons why there's a culture of embracing technology here in Australia in particular. Uh, a lot of that's probably stimulated by the federal and state government spending around major projects, and that's pushing uh, contractors to adopt technology in ways that uh, we haven't seen elsewhere um, so much. But certainly across the region, um, Japan and South Korea are also uh, really 
burning a path in terms of the adoption of technology um, and how that's led by consumers as well. So there's plenty there as a backdrop for us to refer to. But Cameron, I wanted to start with a question for you and ask you as, uh, as major contractors here in Australia uh, tackle digital transformation, um, and it must be top of mind for your business, what does digital transformation mean to you? And what do you see being the catalysts for, uh, for NELP as a project? Um, and then I guess more broadly the industry, but really interested in what you see being the catalysts for NELP in particular around digital transformation. Yeah, good question. Um, digital transformation or technology in itself, to me, is is, is one part of the of the, the three pillars of, of project controls uh, for me. So people, process, and technology. Um, you know, you hear it spoken about a lot, but it, I mean, digital transformation is interesting because every organization is continually going through some form of digital transformation whether they're aware of it or not you know it might be bringing in new software products or it might be a complete overhaul um so there and it happens quite quite often um very rarely do they stay in the same place for too long these days so for me um the technology part is critically important because the project is the scale of the project has just gotten so large now i mean in in, in melbourne and victoria there's three or four projects well over uh, 10 billion dollars at the moment so yeah. you know you're not running hundreds of millions you're running billions and billions and, and to run those sort of projects brings additional complexity uh, generates a tremendous amount of data and you really need to have efficient and effective uh, technology supporting your process uh, that's fit for purpose for the people who are actually out there deploying um, every organization is obviously different and every organization's on a different path and a different um, timeline of their of their uh, of their journey uh, so i think that i think that um you know, there's a lot of focus on digital transformation, but for me, it's, it's actually becoming a part of business as usual. I walk into an organization and I need to understand their enterprise architecture. I need to understand what, what they're using and how they're using it, so how their process and technology works. I need to understand the maturity of the people they've got in the organization. So where you start to recommend um, efficiencies and where you could actually improve on what's going on, you need to understand uh, the, the caliber of the people in the organization you're bringing these sort of uh, advancements in on. So I just think it's really becoming a part from a project controls perspective, it's becoming a part of your, 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 your tool bag now. Um, mm. and, and we do we do put a big emphasis on digital transformation, but essentially it's just, it's just making the technology as efficient and effective as possible. Um, and as I say, the biggest catalyst I think for change is a large amount of organizations who still are a little bit behind um, a lot of other industries, particularly in civil infrastructure, a little bit behind as all the data shows and the size and complexity and risk associated with the projects we're delivering now, you can't approach that with the old band-aid solution and a bit of Excel here and there. It really is, uh, it requires a really concise understanding of what you're trying to do. Um, and, and they are leveraging a lot of new technologies that have just improved so much over the last few years. So uh, if you walk into any organization, they're all on their own path, their own journey at different parts of that timeline, but definitely everybody's undertaking some form of digital transformation, whether they know it or not. Yeah, it's interesting. It's just pervasive in that way. It's just how how much you acknowledge it as an organization and take take control of that. That's right. You either officially make a big, you know, we're, this is what we're doing and it's it's a, it's a it's a big journey and path of going down or you're just doing it um, subconsciously anyway, so. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Yeah, I think it's, it's certainly interesting to see how some contractors are using it as a differentiator in their offering to project owners and indeed how project owners are taking far more interest in it. I think that the scale of projects that you describe is one of the key reasons for that, that you have to be able to be on top of what's going on and these are tools to help you do that. Uh, absolutely, and that's something I'm actively looking for. We, we've got six packages all in excess of a billion dollars and multiple billions of dollars on the project I'm on right now. And when we get um, tenders received from proponents, I'm actually going in and looking at, you know, what is their technology approach? What is their, uh, how does their process and their technology work together? I'm really interested in seeing what they're bringing and what differentiator they're making. And we're assessing them on that. Um, at NELP, we're bringing in what I call an industry-leading approach to the way clients operate, where we've, we've gone through um, and still going through a digital transformation journey across all of MTIA over the last uh, two and a half years now. And, and we've really uh, revamped the way we look at technology and the way we work. And we've been able to actually align five project offices over $80 billion worth of work on the back of a digital transformation initiative, which has been 
Uh, I, I haven't seen anywhere in the world has gone through something like what we've just gone through in the last two and a half years. And and so what we're doing now is we're in, insisting that the contractors adhere to what we're looking for and they come along that journey with us. So we're trying to lead the industry in that change. Fantastic. Michael, um, your perspective is a really interesting one. As I said before, you, you've been on both the, the vendor side and the client side. So what is it that uh, digital transformation means to you? What have you seen and what's your perspective on that, looking at it from from all, all views of the industry? Yeah, look, to look to Cam to Cam's point, you know, digital transformation from our perspective and, and WSP as an organisation, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're, we, we actively work with and encourage our clients to become what we call future ready. And this is basically around operational improvement. So using technologies to enhance your ways of working, basically. And as, as Cam said, that's a that's a, almost a business as usual um, style of approach. You know, what we see, obviously we work with a lot of organizations, a lot of clients. We deal primarily in project-based industries, you know, serving clients like Cam's organization and others. Um, and as project-based organizations and, and uh, uh, and the industries we serve uh, undoubtedly are unique. You know, we've got project teams that are really consistent. Um, you've got relationships between um, client and owner and, uh, and, and PMO, um, mm -hmm. where you've got that, that different contractual relationships amongst all the participants. You know, even with the contracting organizations we work with downstream in our, in our contracts and subcontractors, they themselves are federalized and, and run a decentralized approach. The whole the whole landscape around alliancing and and JVs that only compounds these I suppose these the, the challenge the challenges and the landscape in which we work so that divergence in process is um, is uh, is widespread shall we say mm -hmm. so so we we help you know, we help you know we help our clients strive for that that business process first approach as as Cam was saying operational improvement. I've said in other forums that you know technology for technology's sake um, is not always the right approach. You know, you you you, um, you attempt to deliver benefits, um, otherwise, you know, that technology is not adopted. Um, the introduction of, of new technologies and new processes and ultimately operational improvement, it's it's all about breaking down those in, internal barriers because you've got that, you've got you've got information loss that happens not only across participants in JVs and alliancing and across projects, but also within within organisations as well. Um, and if you target a digital digital uh, transformation initiative that's too narrow, you ultimately leave, leave money on the table. And you've got to strive for that continuous improvement. You know, that, that those first wave benefits are always great, but, you know, you always have to strive for, yeah, for, for continuous improvement and making an ongoing, an ongoing initiative, so. Very good, yeah, I think there's a, Certainly, a case now for uh, now it's kind of out the box. There's a, a chance to really continue to drive that change within the industry to strive for greater performance, greater efficiency, and I think leave behind some of those those uh, those thoughts and beliefs that uh, construction engineering works on. It's forced to work on narrow margins. There's variability and. Uh, risk at every turn and it's like saying well okay what can be done to mitigate that and what can be done to actually improve the efficiency of the organizations that are participating in these major projects as well for everyone's benefit so cam uh, you spoke a bit about the uh, journey that now that mtia is the um, melbourne transport infrastructure authority have been on to uh, to get through uh, a lot of the transformation challenges but for those that aren't as well versed in the challenges of an owner, what are some of the specific things that you've been working towards or challenges that you've faced from say a planning or a, a document management point of view? Yes, it's, it's, it's another really good question. So just a little bit of a background on the catalyst of why we went down this journey. The major transport infrastructure authority had four live projects uh, or project offices set up delivering projects all over, all over Melbourne all over yeah all over the greater melbourne and the northeast link was the fifth to come online and when i walked in the door they basically said just copy one of the other project offices and when we went and investigated what they were doing we thought well it's not exactly where we like to be they're not using the technology that i, I prefer to use 
they're all quite um, desperate the way they're working. They're all set up separately, uh, individually, uh, in their own right. So I started asking questions at the, the governing body, the Office of Director General, about why don't we look at some form of um, strategic alignment across all of the offices, and that's where it started. So conversations around trying to understand process, um, well, understanding the existing state, the current state, understanding process. So we, we had to align the five offices essentially on, on how we actually worked, planning and scheduling, doc control, information management, estimating cost control, quality management, risk management, all of the, all of the main functions. And then once we identified the processes and how we worked and got alignment on that, we started to look for technological solutions that would be able to to, to complement that and help us deliver that process. Uh, we went through a, a, a large process interviewing three existing incumbents, um, and we ended up with a technology solution that, that was put, um, standardised across the organisation. So that's taken two and a half years, and there's probably still another year on that journey to get all the way through. It also includes a, a migration of the um, ERP Oracle to the cloud, and also includes bringing in a new contract management system, Oracle Unifier. So it's, it's a very large program that we went on. From a client's perspective, the, the challenges you face within an organisation, if you look at, at, at NELP, uh, you know, $16 billion is a social, essentially spread over six mega projects uh, in mm -hmm. one program of works. And each one of those is different. So you've got a, a PPP, uh, a public-private partnership, uh, which is in excess of, you know, nine to 10 billion. You've got managing contract, you've got alliance contracts, uh, four alliance contracts. So they're all got different forms of contract. Um, each one of those has um, requirements built into those contracts. So from a project controls perspective, we not only have to operate the business that is the North East Link project, which means we need to be able to generate estimates and cost control and doc collaboration, information management, risk, um, quality, the whole lot, um, contract management and so on. We also require each one of those packages to provide us information on a regular basis. Uh, and and there's a couple of ways you can go about it. You can just let it sort of run loosely and get in whatever comes in and you'll never make head and the tail of it. Or mm -hmm. you do what we've done where we, we build specific requirements into every single contract. So there's project controls requirements in every contract, regardless of the nature of the contract. And we tell them exactly what we're looking for and how we're looking for it. Um, I've, I stop short of, of dictating systems because I don't want to go down that path. But what I do do is I give certainly requirements that would lend them to have to go down to certain um, avenues of certain technology and be at a certain level to be able to generate the information we're looking for. So um, document collaboration is a very interesting one. We're obviously using Innate Document. Uh, and whilst I'm not telling any of the other the, the projects to use Innate Document, um, they absolutely have to communicate to us within our system. So you'll probably find by more osmosis, they'll probably go down that path. Um, for things like planning and scheduling, obviously P6 is fairly universal. For cost control, they'll all use different software. That's just the way of civil infrastructure. They all use different technology. Um, what we require is certain information coming in on a, on a regular basis, which is typically monthly. So we've been very specific and we've even been as specific as we've given them templates to fill in and say, this is how we want to see the information. And for the alliances, we're essentially in, in the requirements, we're giving them templates to fill in. We're actually, we've developed our own WBS and CBS and, and risk breakdown structure, and we're mm -hmm. providing those templates to the entities at the EOI stage, expression of interest. And we're saying, that's how we want you to structure your estimate. That's how we want you to structure your schedule. And that's how we want you to structure your risk profile. We, we can then assess it properly in an apples for apples perspective, and we can see exactly what's going on when you are successful, your operating estimate transitions into an operating budget and for the life of the project, you're reporting to those coding levels, which then gives us very important actual information in cost, time and risk. It's never been done on any project that I've ever seen in Australia where we've gone to that level of detail to get that information in so we can have accurate, reliable benchmarking. In my opinion, anyone who walks around saying they've got good benchmarking data and they haven't gone to the level of dictating coding structures and the way the technology actually brings the information in, then it's it's not worth relying upon. So we're, we're really using the process and the technology to our advantage, but also to upskill and to help the industry. Um, mm -hmm. So, and the challenge, the major challenges we face is they all operate differently. They've all got different software solutions, technology solutions. They all have um, similar, but very different processes in the way they work. So there's no standardization across the industry. Uh, in the way in project management, it just doesn't exist. Mm. Um, yeah. There, there is a little bit, but there's really gaps everywhere. So we're trying to control 
a standardised approach across all of our projects. Uh, and so uh, that brings immense challenges and you have very interesting conversations and <laughs> And a lot of, you know, the amount of times you sit there and they say things like, oh, you know, you're trying to line costs and time to get earned value and earned value doesn't work and all of this sort of right. stuff. And it's like, yeah. there's so many other reasons we're trying to do this, but it's a journey. It, you, you're bringing the industry on the journey and, and uh, it's, it's, it's quite an exciting one. Absolutely. Yeah, I think undoubtedly what you've just explained there illustrates how much of a, a pioneer um, I think you are, Cam, uh, in terms of pushing that pushing the boundaries and the reasons why as well, which is important for people to understand. It's not just for the sake of it, as Michael said. And, mm -hmm. and Michael, your perspective again, um, what do you see, I mean, in the organisations you're working with um, at WSP, uh, what are you seeing as the tipping point inside those client organisations for them to decide now is the time that we should be more proactively addressing digital transformation? and and how do you how do you help them navigate the way forward so they can get some traction and get some some progress against those objectives? Yeah, no, it's a it's a good question. Actually, uh, to, uh, to 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 Cam's point about um, uh, aligning structures and processes right from the early parts of a project all the way through. For, I think you said Cam from EOI stage down and uh, encouraging the, the your downstream supply chain. Um, it's an interesting perspective because we have a, a slightly different one. We're working on a major program of work up here in, uh, in New South Wales where they've uh, embedded those uh, concepts and that way of working uh, right from the get-go. They see the data structures and alignment and working on common systems and having a common technology landscape as much as it's possible and practicable for the downstream participants. Uh, the regional delivery consortiums, of which we're one of those, um, is an absolutely key to, the, key to their success. Um, you know, our, our client, um, and it's been it's been well publicised. It's been it's been uh, it's been in the press um, that you know making best use of best use of of uh, of con constitu constituent funds, <laughs> being a yep. being, being a, a government business, um, government organisation, um, is obviously very very high on their agenda as well as all the service delivery aspects of their business. So being able to to prove that they're going through risk mitigation, that they're using 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 funds in the right way, um, that we're delivering as part of our contracts across across uh, across uh, across greater the greater Sydney area, um, they wouldn't be able to do that without having the right systems and processes and having that whole of program that that whole of value chain approach from 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 their perspective all the way through to their delivery partners and then from us down to our. Uh, subcontractors so it's mm. a it's a very interesting uh interesting uh, set of uh requirements that we're that we're working with and it's, it, look for us it's exciting because for, for us as wsp this 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 capability around digital digital project delivery is a key differentiator for us winning work and it was a key differentiator for winning one of these regional delivery consortiums um you know our mantra was around delivering differently which is this encouraging this integrated approach to enabling um, our, our way of working with with simple and effective systems and processes, not simplistic, but but simple. You know, yep. so standardisation in construction delivery, you know, designing solutions and product selections and work crews and and you know, having that that very efficient way of working um, centred around value and certainty was yeah, what was was not a nice to have. It was a ticket to play, mm. um, and. Look, those that 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 question around digital transformation. We have many different points of view and many different perspectives on that. But as I said at the outset, where we act as a, a project management contractor, you know, it's incumbent upon us to to deliver our our projects on behalf of our clients and and not only deliver a physical asset in some cases, but deliver a information asset or a digital twin, if you will. Um, and we can only do that by. Um, by having a standardised information platform that we use to deliver those projects. You know, the days of stringing together cost and schedule and documents and construction activities and safety information in Excel and manual systems, that's very much old thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, the only way we can, we can deliver those projects and be agile and have a cost-effective delivery is, is by having, standardized, having a standardised approach, set of, standardised set of processes um, all backed by a standardised uh, technology platform that we go into our projects with. 
Yep. So, yeah, great question, Rob. It's a digital transformation, Michael, supposed to provide um, a better outcome and uh, offer more transparency. But to achieve that, it, there's a number of key challenges and um, it's not an easy thing to get that shift of culture inside organisations to to see the value and the purpose and the, and the reason why it's important. So from your point of view, what have you seen being the hallmarks of success or the key contributors to a successful transformation journey? And what are the, the top three, if you like, uh, the things that you see being necessary to make it a successful transformation process within organisations? Yeah, look, and I'll probably touch on one of Cam's earlier comments. It's, a, it's around... It's around. It's as much around people as it is process and technology. the The human impact of, you know, taking an organisation through that 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 change process can never be um, underestimated. You know, shall we say you've got to you've got to bring people along the journey um, in you know a number of you know, major projects that we've been involved in where you're working alliances and JVs, quite often from our experience, those organizations being brought together have come, the, the, the individuals from that from from those home organizations come from in some cases very different and very diverse um, levels of overall maturity. So, so the organizational change management uh, process hmm. you know cannot be underscored enough. And it's making sure people have you know, it's it's sort of business fundamentals, if you if you will, making sure people have clear lines of of accountability and authority, and you know, decision making, making sure that those are very well understood. Um, but also, as you're going through that transformation process, particularly when you when you're introducing new systems, is that you know you have to you have to uh, encourage that ownership. You have to encourage the, the 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 yeah the ownership of those processes, the parts of the system that they'll be responsible for through that journey. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, you've got to monitor the compliance to to whatever processes you you uh, you put in play. You've got to make sure yep. your people are trained. It's all the fundamentals of a, of, a, of a change management process, I would say. Yeah, not to be underestimated. Not and underestimated. Cam, of course, your, your time at, at Lendlease um, and, uh, and, and BP as well, you've seen, you've seen a lot of these changes within in the client or the contractor organization as well as the owner so anything you'd want to add there around what what you see being the hallmarks for success or things that you really got to start with as fundamentals before you embark on the journey yeah certainly um i was just reflecting when as, as michael was chatting there i think this has been the fifth time in in nearly 15 years i've gone into an organization and created some form of project controls capability and every single one of those has required a um some form of technology journey every single one of them um and all with their own challenges um some similar and some different um it's interesting to your earlier comment rob when you're saying that you know um the evidence is or, or the benefit of digital transformation is, is real one one of the things that i've I've been struggling with is for quite a while is it's not as easy to walk into an executive and say you have to go down this journey and here's all this um, realized benefits from all these previous business cases where this has occurred before because right. it's still a little disparate the way people are doing it what what would be very beneficial um, certainly to me if anyone watching this video has actually gone on such a journey and they've 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 created the business case they've identified their their uh, benefits and they've been able to realize uh, realize and articulate and validate those benefits then by all means make them available to the broader community because that sort of stuff helps every mm -hmm. single person walking into an executive one one of the biggest challenges is is when you're in an organization is trying to understand how um, how adverse to the change they are and, and where they're willing to go and what they're really looking for what problem they're essentially trying to solve from a CI perspective, I suppose. Uh, and every organisation is different, but but one thing's fairly similar. The people that own the keys to the dollars to be able to allow you to go down a transformation journey are typical people in their mid to late careers who, when they delivered projects, Excel wasn't really a thing. So uh, mm -hmm. when you walk in and start talking about, you know, the, the sort of journey you'd like to go on and the technology you'd like to use, their eyes sort of glaze over a little bit. So right. I think definitely the, the number one thing for me in any organisation I go into now is understanding 
how adverse the change they are, um, what their current state is, um, who the key drivers are, and engaging the executive and the decision makers immensely early um, to make sure that you go on that that journey and you take them on the journey with you and you've got that um, executive support. The executive support is pretty much the hardest thing you're going to face. I've mm. spent a long time in a lot of different organisations going down a path and then you get to that commitment time and, and, and you know, the value of these things can be quite excessive and the, and the, and the journey long. I mean, any digital transformation initiatives around between two to three and a half years, really, in, in, um, which is what I've seen in practice. So, and, and cost millions and millions of dollars. Um, so, yeah. you know, you, you need to get that engagement. You need to understand um, what problem they're trying to solve and how likely they are to go down that journey with you. And, yeah. and then the second most important thing after the executives is identifying all the associated stakeholders because particularly in this sort of thing, organisations are set up very functionally. Um, and you'll find that each function holds a little piece of the puzzle. You know, finance will hold the ERP and um, you might have engineering or, or project controls holding cost control and quality systems and dot collaboration systems. So you do find that you've you've got to bring a large group of stakeholders together on the line journey, all heading in the same direction. So concepts such as, um, you know, end-to-end -end solution and, and common data environments and so on, that could uh, that could cover, you know, five or six different functions and you need to bring all of those functions along for the same journey and everybody's at a different stage uh, yeah. in, their, in their maturity around these things. So they're very challenging. These, these to do a successful digital transformation is, is immensely, immensely challenging and, and you need a great team around you. You need great vendor support. Uh, you need, which means we need, you know, continual improvement in the products that are in the market mm. and you need to have your executive and all your stakeholders on side. Yep. Do you think, um, and it's, it's a question I'd like to put to both of you, so do you think in the current environment that we're in, particularly here in Australia, you know, we've seen a, a long a long path of investment from government in infrastructure projects. It's been a long tail. We've got, as you said, Ken, there's what, $80 billion just uh, here in, in and around Greater Melbourne. Uh, then you've got uh, a very similar number, if not exceeding that, in in Sydney as well. Collectively, there is undoubtedly over $200 billion worth of projects underway across Australia and a, and a, a 10 year pipeline promised by government as well. We've got shortages in um, labour and skilled, uh, skilled people to work on these projects. We've got a limited number of contractors who are uh, competing for that work. Um, do you think all of these factors are contributing to to force organisations, be that client or contractor, to to take the risks that they've otherwise perceived to be and and leap forward into uh, anything that offers them a chance to operate more efficiently? Are we at a turning point? Is it, are we have we sort of tipped over the edge um, as we enter this next decade? I, I think we are, with it, undoubtedly we are, but it's not because of the drivers of the constraints in the market. I think the drivers are the fact that the scale is so large and the politically driven accountability is is, is huge. Your front page news, um, the, the, the thought or the threat of mismanagement and not being able to understand exactly what's going on and being on top of the information um, and being able to make, you know, reliable, um, sorry, timely um, informed decisions on accurate, reliable information. I think those pressures are driving more so than what's actually happening with the capacities in the market and, and what the market forces are. Um, there's no doubt that government, um, whether it be state or federal, are under immense scrutiny um, to deliver these projects well. And it's it's a daily news story on on, on mm. you know projects overrun cost and time and so on. So I think I think what they've come to the fact they've realized that this is such a big scale now and it's such a vast um, pipeline of work that you need to make sure that you're doing everything you possibly can and 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 having the excuse of not having the technology to support what you require that's that's no longer a valid excuse you know I, I think that's been the big impetus it's the fact that it's gotten so large now that they can't possibly do it without it and and one thing I do know is government do want accurate reliable timely information to make decisions mm -hmm. on they don't want to be making poor decisions on poor information um, and I've seen that that was probably the biggest catalyst behind our transformation. It really was that the governing body, the Office of Director General, could not 
really understand exactly what was happening out there and they were getting um, very different um, versions from different ent entities and they wanted to standardize the message and standardize the information so they could really understand what's going on that's more of a driver than um, you know the the volume of what's happening in the market it certainly is more them having accurate reliable information good yeah michael from your perspective from wsp that sounds like it should be a, a clear opportunity probably one that is opening up uh opening up all sorts of channels for wsp but what, what's your take on that what's your perspective and where the business is going yeah the look, yeah look it's an interesting point and look to <clears throat> excuse me to cam's point before you know reputational enhancement or the threat of reputational damage in the market um, is is uh, by far and away you know one of those you know huge governing factors on these on these major projects like you said there's not a day or a week goes by that we don't see something in the press about cost overruns or project overruns um certainly the projects that we've been working on i mentioned one a bit earlier about just justifying constituent funds to ipar that was you know that was certainly one of their key drivers to get more accurate um timely uh cost information um back from all their their um their delivery partners of, of, of course and we're one of those um so that's that's obviously key um, but what's, what's interesting as well is that it's it's also opening up um, opportunities for us, you know, in in terms of well, once 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 our the, the organisation that we work with get those fundamentals in place mm. around cost and schedule and you know document control that 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 bedrock of project information, it then gives organisations the enough ability to breathe and invest in innovations that surround that. Um, so on, um, you know, so whether it be um, uh, whether it be digital twinning, whether it be um, you know AI, um, mm. whether it be using um, drones in field, mm. whether it be tapping into the, you know SCADA information for you know for, for pipeline reliability for, for for water networks, whatever it might be, there's a there's a variety of really exciting um, innovation opportunities that that surround you know surround any project where you've again where you've got that. Not only timely information, but where you're 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 suddenly got a place to put all the project information that you're starting starting to harvest. Yep. You know, when you're capturing that information at a, at a what do I call it at an atomic level. Mm -hmm. right? So if you're capturing information at, a, at an atomic level, you can then start to do some very interesting things around it. And so, yeah, that's where we're seeing that that innovation then starting to to kick in is where that where 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 your organisations have got that that foundation and firm bedrock, reporting cost and time in a predictable way. Let's go on. Let's go and, and, and take take the technology in some interesting places. That's interesting. That really is. Yeah, let's 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 turn to that. I think that's a great topic to to dive a little deeper on. We we, we know from the survey that we just conducted that um, ninety six percent of respondents had faith in the potential technology to help them improve productivity. So there's certainly a an appetite for it, and um, a, a, a large proportion, the majority of people. Uh, surveyed in that 300 um, as part of our global outlook saw that it's already delivered some improvements. So, Michael, you've touched on some of those technological advancements, ways that uh, companies, projects can adopt technology in the next phase to, to really push the barriers even further, improve the quality and the quantity of data that they can bring into the projects and decision making. Cameron, with, uh, with NELP, underway uh, you're at an exciting point with a you know a five to seven year outlook in terms of that project um, completion so what's some of the technologies that you're starting to see that are proposed by contractors or things that the the project is considering to help monitor and and pull in data uh, more effectively yeah, there's a lot of focus around uh, digital engineering, um, a lot of focus around, um, you know, our approach and, and, and what that's going to look like and, and and how that's going to align across the whole project. I think, I mean, you know, something our scale and what we're doing, which is essentially a very large road project, freeway project with a really big tunnel in the middle of it, you can't move away from the fundamental basics of cost, risk and time. Um, obviously, quality is really, really important as well but a huge amount of focus for us because of the scale on, on cost, risk and time. So um, from our perspective, we've set the technology landscape up so we're able to report on all the fundamental um, fundamentals you typically see. Uh, what we're encouraging 
the market to do is to really focus on things to your point, Rob, around productivities and, and benchmarking and so on. Um, one of the great things about what we're doing, the way we're setting it up, is two of our mega alliances go probably a year, year and a half before the last two. So we'll be able to sit there and get the data coming in and analyze the data and say to one of the alliance um, contracts, you know, when it comes to this, you know, it might be building retaining walls or it could be laying pavement or whatever it might be, you know, we're seeing these sort of costs and productivities. But by the way, um, the, your counterpart project in the north this is what they're receiving so maybe you guys could get together and have a chat about how you can improve productivities and what what one's doing compared to the other and then mm. the two alliances that come on at the end they'll have the benefit of, of, of all of that data and information that's happened in those projects because they're all freeway road projects they're all constructing freeways and doing the same scope of works just in different areas and different scales so we've got the ability to capture you know, key elements around cost, risk, time, quality, and to be able to use that information, analyze it, and help our uh, contractors improve their productivity based on what we're seeing. And that's the fundamental importance of setting up your technology and your process so that you can actually get that reliable information. You know, when you listen to academics like Bent Fluberg and others talk about reference class forecasting, absolutely amazing concept, but complete mm. waste of time if your technology and processes aren't set up in a standardised manner and you haven't got a high level of um, surety around the way that information is being managed all the way through the life cycle. Once you've got all of that, then that information is gold. But mm. if you don't standardise the approach and if you don't have that surety around how that's being generated, then it's rubbish in, rubbish out. So, um, yeah, we, we're, we're focusing on the basics, but we're doing it in a way that uh, we can make it as reliable as possible to help all of our projects. Excellent. I think that that's interesting in terms of the, the, the barriers there to potentially getting the data um, into the organisations and... Um, and best used. Uh, Michael, turning that question to you, what what do you see being the biggest barriers for companies trying to leverage their data? And I think it's really turning that to ask what advice would you give them to to make sure they can remove those barriers and, and begin to get some benefits? Yeah, look, it's probably to, to build on, on Cam's point and to reflect back on that. I guess my earlier point about you know managing project managing project information at the right level, you know when we deal with our our owner clients, what do they see? They see the asset, they see the mine or the road or the 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 end outcome that they're looking for us to help them manage, right? But those that are charged with you know realizing those visions, they see what cubic yards of concrete and piece marks of steel, right? So you've got this this huge disparity. Um, in terms of the, the the end deliverable, the the um, the expectation, the outcome, if you will, um, and you know the engineers and contractors who are delivering that, you know, for them, um, and for a lot of organisations, you know, it's that very that that having that capacity to manage that project information um, at that, you know, like I said, that that lowest common denominator, as as mm. as. As, as Cam was saying, so that you can do that benchmarking, um, you know that's that's impossible to do if you're if you've made a, a technology or a process solution that's got no way of being able to cope with that level of granularity. It's right. like trying to you know run a very detailed cost breakdown structure in a in a in an accounting system. It's just it's like apples and oranges. You know, uh, an estimating system will hold you know tens and thousands of line line items. From a quantity takeoff, but yeah, your your accounting system is big buckets. So mm -hmm. so helping helping our clients understand that they've got to be able to manage their information at that atomic level. You know, having that lowest common denominator approach suddenly makes things like like Ken was saying around benchmarking and having that firm foundation um, possible. And the other dimension as well is around having having that having that flexibility, right? You know, project every project is different. Um, and what we typically see in a lot of organisations is that the, the processes that are put in place, and in some cases, unfortunately, the technologies that they put in place, um, you know, it's not one size, it, it's not one size fits all. Organisations mm -hmm. invest in things, that, I mean, invest in processes and technologies that, by their very nature, are brittle, and that's right. that's that's probably a suboptimal approach. So you know, we always we always look for technologies like innates that is inherently flexible that does have a 
a modular and interoperable approach to the way that different capabilities can be brought to bear for, for our clients. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's the two, the, the two key takeaways, information at the right level being captured so you can benchmark and having those flexible processes and technologies to accommodate. Good, good advice. So as we think about uh, bringing this in and wrapping things up, um, a last question for both of you, and I, I want to give you a chance to offer perhaps one piece of advice. What's the what's the one key thing? Um, if you can bring it into into focus as one item, what would be your takeaway for people listening today around digital transformation and um, what they should do, regardless of what stage they're at in the digital transformation process or the the project uh, maturing? That they're experiencing what would be your single piece of advice and uh michael might uh, stick with you as the as the cook's <laughs> turning and ask you that one first i knew you'd ask me that one first <laughs> <laughs> sorry we can go to cam next if you want but yeah, i figured like, i figured the cogs were turning i'm sure you've got plenty of things you could yeah, you can yeah, offer us look there, there's no silver bullet right everyone's got to do the hard charts yeah but look you know Cam rightly pointed out, and I'll definitely underscore this as well, exec sponsorship, mm. chat management, and business case. And, you know, just again, just to bring you back to Cam's point for a moment there around business case information, you know, other other technologies that have been around in the marketplace. You know, look at MRP, MRP2, ERP. That's been around for, what, 25, 30, 40 years. Um, there's a, an absolute avalanche of business case information and benchmarking and value engineering that surrounds ERP style processes. There's an absolute dearth of, um, of that same level of um, business case and value engineering work that's, that's been done in the, in the industries and the processes that Cam, you and I inhabit around project controls. So um, uh, for, for, for in terms of, a, you know, what's a, where would you take this? Yeah, absolutely, exec sponsorship, Bring your, bring your people with you, um, select the right technologies and have your mm -hmm. solid business case. Perfect. Ken? Uh, everything Michael just said. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and I mean, what I would do is I'd recommend is, you know, recognize that this is, uh, to, to Mike's point, there's no silver bullet. Every organization is different. Be very flexible. Um, and and remember that this is a journey. It's not It's not an overnight solution this takes years to do properly um and and in and if you're in an organization that's looking for quick fixes and they're not they're not willing to go on that longer journey then you're going to struggle but i mean fundamentally i adopt the continuous improvement approach you sit down you, you're trying to find the problem you're trying to solve you go out and you see and assess what's out there what's the existing um, state you try and do a root cause analysis of where the problems are and then you try and develop solutions around answering that to find the problem um, question and you'll find that you know that's that's a pretty good approach to take um I, many years ago when i went this journey first i walked into organizations saying i know what you need you need estimating systems you need this that and the other now i'm a much more mature relaxed laid-back fella <laughs> and uh it's much more about tell me tell me what you're looking for let me let me see where i what i'm seeing out there and, and then let's work collectively together uh, in a collaborative way to get to a solution for you uh, but one thing is absolutely guaranteed it is not one solution fits all every organization so I said the fifth time in I don't know 12 or 15 years I've done it and they're all different and they've yep. all got different drivers they're all and they've all been different solutions um, I suppose the philosophies are similar but they're all different so it sounds really listen to you both it's it's less when we talk about digital transformation as if it's a um, as if it's a, a phase um in a in an organization's journey but it actually sounds listen to you both as if it's it's more about choosing a uh, choosing to adopt a, a part that as part of your methodology and you in how you operate um it's something that doesn't leave the organization it's just introducing it it's a it's a it's like a lifestyle change you don't do that for three months it's something that you adopt for the rest of your life and you make it work for it to be sustainable and provide long-term benefits the same is true of the use of digital tools in in project management i guess that's if i'm if i'm right if that makes sense to you both um that sounds like what we're really saying at the end of this yeah ultimately it needs to become part of your, it needs to become part of your dna yeah um, yeah 
And it must be frustrating for all software vendors when they go into an organization and every organization is looking for that silver bullet quick fix. Just get it done. Just bring your product and solve all the problems. And, and you know, exactly. good vendors push back on that and explain that it's not about that. It's a journey. It's much more than just, you know, here's a suite of um, you know, technology that's going to solve your problem. It's much, much more than that. Um, you know, and that's one of the things I've always loved about N8. It was never about here's a product, just run with it or solve all your problems. It's what problems are you trying to solve and how can we um, be a part of that answer, part of that solution. But there are a lot of vendors out there who literally, you know, out of the box, plug and play, go with us and we're there. And it's yeah. just never the case. It's just never the case. Yeah. Great. Well, anyway, that's, and Cam, thank you for that. I mean, that's, that's really why we've had the opportunity to, to have the three of us talk today because um, you, we've, We've been along that journey together over the last few years in different mm -hmm. ways and um, and pleased that we continue to do so. So uh, thanks very much for your time today, gentlemen. I think it's been a, a fantastic conversation that we could very easily keep running with for another couple of hours. We'd probably have to go and get another round of coffees in if we were able to be face to face right now and, and keep the chat going. And uh, hopefully before too long, we'll be able to maybe have a, a longer lunch and conversation along the same lines. That would be a nice way to do it. Yeah. And, uh, um, so look, thank you again um, for all of you listening today and watching this. Um, hope you've enjoyed the conversation. Uh, please, before you sort of leave the environment that you're watching this in, please download the Global Projects Outlook report that, uh, that Innate put together over the last 12 months with that research across the world. Um, you can find out more about this and other webinars at innate.com forward slash webinars to watch the on-demand recordings. Um, this was the last, the last episode in our series of digital transformation. So please take a moment to, to uh, go back and watch the others in this series. Um, and uh, we look forward to talking to you all again and bringing some more interesting discussion to you in uh, future webinars. And I'm sure we will see Cam and Michael back for more commentary around other topics in the future as well. So we'll wrap it up there. Thank you both for your time and uh, look forward to project success with both of you. Pleasure. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Rob. you. All right. Thanks. Bye for now.